another episode of Casey Talks Critters. This one's gonna be super special as we're not focusing on an animal in particular, but we're gonna talk about veterinary care. I have a super special guest. Her name is Dr. Rachel Sue, and you might know her from social media accounts like her TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, or her YouTube as the Exotic Pet Vet. And this episode will also be on your favorite podcast platform. So make sure that you are following us there, as well as on our social media platforms like Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, all of them. So let's get started. <laughs> so Dr. Rachel, can you tell me a little bit about your experience with animals? Yes. So I am a vet that works in Dallas, Texas. I uh, um, work at a clinic that sees around 50% exotics and 50% dog and cat. Um, and I, and of those 50% exotics, it's probably split, you know, 30% uh, birds, birds, 30% uh, reptiles, and 30% pocket pets, which is what we call our small furry creatures like ferrets, rabbits, and rodents. And then a little bit of, you know, crazy exotics. Sometimes we see monkeys and, you know, other other weird, weird exotic things. That is all really cool. And um, for our fans who may have not caught um, an episode of Casey Talks Critters in the past, I am actually a certified vet tech myself. So that kind of works out to be like a human um, RN, but for animals. So I'm super excited that we're doing a veterinary um, episode because it's so near and dear to my heart. I haven't been in clinical medicine for a few years now and I miss it so much, but I do think it's so important and I still want to bring this information to our customers and to the public um, because I think it's very, very important. Yeah. Um, so, how did you know that you first wanted to be a vet? Like, what was it for you? So I kind of was like, you know, most people when they're, or most kids when they're, you know, five years old and they say, oh, I want to work with animals. And, you know, being a vet, you think, oh, I working with animals is the dream job. And then as I got a little bit older towards like middle school and high school, I, I kind of, you know, lean into other interests. I thought I was going to go into human medicine for a little bit because I, I really like the thought of medicine, but I, I couldn't see myself just working with dogs and cats. And then as I got into college, mm -hmm. I realized, oh, you know, you could work with exotic pets and, uh, you know, I, I could combine both my passions. So then I went back to, you know, striving for veterinary medicine. And, um, I did four years of undergrad and four years of vet school and some, you know, training, and here I am today. Oh, amazing. It's it's really great, and I can definitely um, appreciate what you're saying about not just wanting to work with dogs and cats. Like, don't get me wrong. I have dogs. My Like, I, I love dogs and cats, um, but I knew that dog and cat medicine wasn't for me either. Like, I knew I wanted more, mm -hmm. so, like, exotics and wildlife for is where I went, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um... So I want to talk a little bit about just, um, normally we talk about reptiles here on this show, but we're going to just do it broad and talk exotic pets, just exotic veterinary medicine. Um, so why do you think people don't like to bring in their exotic pets to the vet? So there's a couple factors that I think goes into it. Um, the first one being a lot of people can't find an exotic vet or they don't know that they exist. You know, I've had people bring me their pets and... You know, for, they said for the longest time they didn't know that there were vets that treated other than, you know, dog and cat and farm animals, you know. And then the trouble is finding one. You know, if you're in a major city, it's a little bit easier. But if you live in rural areas of the country, it can be, you know, quite a drive to find someone who feels comfortable working with exotics. You know, I have some clients that have driven from states away just to come to my clinic and, and work with me because they don't feel comfortable with the vets that, you know, that see them because... You know, there's some vets that are willing to see exotics, but that's different than being 100% comfortable with them and, and knowing, you know, uh, all that there is to go into it. People have trouble finding a vet that they um, they can that can see their pet. But then, you know, there's other other reasons that they are unwilling is is maybe due to cost. You know, you know, vet vet care is expensive and. You know, with a pet that maybe they bought for only ten dollars at a pet store, they they might not be as willing to invest that that money back into them, especially if they don't have as long of a lifespan. Yeah, that's definitely understandable for sure, and it's actually kind of heartbreaking because when we take in an animal, we you know we are in charge of making sure that they're okay and they have the best life possible. So veterinary care is part of that, and even if it is a low priced tagged animal 
they still deserve all of the care mm-hmm. that any other dog, cat, rabbit would would need. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, so I, I, I understand that too, and I can get, I do understand where people are coming from because it is expensive. Um, veterinary care can um, be pricey because it's not like human medicine with mm-hmm. insurance. I know there's a lot more pet insurance companies now, but um, it's it's just a lot different, and a lot of it comes out of pocket versus through insurance mm-hmm. like we have. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I know. So is there, okay, we're going to go with something a little bit more positive. No, no. Are there any tips you would recommend as a veterinarian when someone is bringing home a new exotic pet? I would say bring them to a vet for an overall wellness checkup as soon as you can. Um, A lot of times people don't realize that what they're thinking is normal behavior or normal signs from their pet is actually them being sick. And a vet is trained to pick up on these subtle cues that um, maybe regular pet owners aren't so in tune with and we can help diagnose and treat things before they progress to the pet being extremely sick, which is when pet owners typically notice things. Um, You can also test for things that you can't typically see, like parasites. You know, some reptiles will be asymptomatic but still carry the parasites in their stool, and they won't get sick from them until they experience something that compromises their immune system. So if we can take care of that before it becomes a problem, then your pet will be healthier. Absolutely, and that is definitely the case. And I don't see it as much with bird patients or small mammal patients, but in reptiles, there's a lot of wild caught. And in that case, you know, they're coming from the wild and they're full of wild parasites. And, you know, that's why our quarantining process is so important and seeing a veterinarian to get those things treated. Um, Doing a fecal examination is not an expensive procedure and... I mean, generally not an expensive procedure, and it can give you a lot of valuable information on your animal. So I think that's a really good um, piece of advice for anyone who brings home a new reptile is definitely go get a fecal done with your veterinarian. Easy and quick, and it can give us a lot of valuable information. And we do see uh, parasites even in oh. captive bred, captive bred uh, reptiles because they... Um, a lot of them are kept communally, and they can spread parasites from one to the other, and it's, it's you know easier to get than you think. Absolutely, and then that's not even considering if it's a zoonotic parasite that we could potentially catch from them. So that's a whole nother thing that we want to make sure that we're safe too handling our reptiles. I have a question about the future of veterinary care and exotics. Do you think that the future is changing. Do you think more people are bringing their pets in than they were before? I think so. I've seen more and more people willing to bring in their exotic pet. Um, It's not just dogs and cats anymore. People are realizing the value of their their birds, their reptiles, their pocket pets, um, and they're um, being more proactive about their health. Um, it used to be you only brought your exotic pet in whenever they you know, developed something that was, you know, they got sick or they got injured. And now people are realizing, oh, it's um, beneficial to bring them in beforehand for wellness visits to make sure we catch things early and we take care of their health proactively. And I, I think that um, mm-hmm. this is going to lead Absolutely. to them living longer and healthier lives and um, having people become more educated. Absolutely. I, I do agree with that 100%. I think... Just like we wouldn't skip veterinary care for our dog and cat, we shouldn't skip it for any of our other pets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So on that same regard, who do you think is your ideal exotic pet keeper? What what does that keeper look like to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would love if, you know, owners were... um, uh, you know, they kept good records of their pets. So you weigh your pet, you know, once a week to see if their weight is turning upward or downward. Um, with with some reptiles, you can even brush their teeth. Bearded dragons, they get dental disease. So one that is, you know, r- willing to brush their their bearded dragon's teeth so that they they stay healthy. Um, one that does wellness care you know wellness testing testing for parasites um, maybe running blood work once once a year to make sure we're catching things like kidney disease and liver disease early so we can give them you know the take take the precautions so that they don't develop further Um, and one that you know they can do research online but also comes to their vet for proper 
husbandry care and diet and enclosures and all of that so we can you know get on the same page and make sure they're set up for success. I love that. That's my ideal keeper too. I love it. That sounds fantastic. I think that is really great. And I, there's a lot of apps that you can download too that kind of help you with your um, care of reptiles. So like one I think is called Reptile Scan and you can document all your weights, all your feedings. It's really great. And then it makes, you know, us as veterinary professionals really happy when you come to us with your binder of all of your documentation of your animal. And we're able to see these spikes in weights and stuff. Like we can check, um, you know, based on when they brumated, like where their weights are dropping off and stuff like that. And um, so it's, it's really interesting to see and very, it makes us really happy. We geek out about it. We really do. <laughs> And if they do something weird, take a video. I love it when owners say, oh, you know, I noticed my, my lizard was, you know, doing this weird thing or, you know, breathing weird. And they, they take a video of it and bring it to me whenever I, you know, see them for an appointment. Because a lot of times they come to the vet and they're not doing it anymore. So if I can see exactly what happened, mm -hmm. it's, it's helpful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Photos, videos, all of that. We love it, definitely. So because this is a Zen Habitat show... As a veterinarian, do you think Zen has a decent product for reptile keeping? Yes, definitely. I have Zen habitats of my own for my own pets. I love that they uh, are able to give you know, our reptiles the space that they deserve because a lot of people used to think, oh, you know, uh, like you can't get as big of a habitat because they're expensive, but they're, they're very reasonably priced and they are made of good materials, ones mm -hmm. that are easy to disinfect. Um, because we do see um, you know, things like mites and bacteria and, and things that you need to you know, clean your enclosures to get rid of. And um, I like that you know, Zen is setting up the um, reptiles for a good habitat that they can thrive in and not just survive in. Oh, that just warmed my heart so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rachel. That was so sweet. We're trying to make progress in the reptile community by you know, just advancing husbandry, trying to make it better everywhere we can. And, you know, we're an enclosure company, so this is where we're going to provide what we can. And we really try to provide a lot of educational content as well. So much of their, um, their health is dependent on their husbandry and how they live in their environment. Um, with reptiles mm -hmm. especially, they need perfect conditions in order to thrive. And Zen really does help set them up for uh, thriving. I love that. I love the surviving is not thriving. We're, we really, really try to, you know, Yeah, reptiles are too, tough. So. It takes a lot to to hurt them, but that doesn't mean they're they're thriving and, and you know. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Um, well, I think we went over a lot of really great information, um, specifically about veterinary care and reptiles and exotic pets, but I want to kind of go in a little bit of information that's more about you and your... Um, your journey as a veterinarian for people who might be interested in going down the same sort of path. So what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Yes. Yeah, so I would say it's never too early to start getting experience. You can try to get in with your local animal hospital or zoo. And even if you have to work as, you know, a kennel tech and work your way up or work as a volunteer, you know, you just get your foot in the door. You know, work as a technician as long as you can uh, to get the experience that you need to build um, building blocks for for vet school. Um, and work in the field before you know deciding whether it's right for you. Because for some people, they they think that this field is great, but it's there are lots of things that go into it that you know people you know don't see at the surface level. Um, I would also say study hard when it comes to math and science, you know, those are also um, foundations for learning veterinary medicine. And if you can, get involved in research. You know, a lot of vet schools are extremely competitive nowadays, and you can't just get in with good grades and experience. You need something else that sets you apart, and that can be, you know, getting involved in research. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I want to say, is it, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say it's only 12% of applicants get into vet school. So it is like, it's a very small number. It's extremely competitive. Um, I might be wrong on that number, so. <laughs> I don't know what the number is, but it's, it's definitely competitive. There are um, not even yeah. a vet school for every state in the country, so it's. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, no, it's, it's it, yeah. And, and I read some statistic, and I don't know how true this one is, but there's like 1,300 pets per veterinarian in America. 
yeah. or something it's, like we're, it's like a very very <laughs> we're definitely overrun right now yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> oh well is there a common myth about your profession that you would like to debunk so I kind of touched on it earlier, but I just want to say it's not as glamorous as it seems. You know, a lot of people have this idea that we just play with puppies and kittens all day or even cool animals like reptiles, but a lot of animals come in sick and treating them isn't just black and white. Uh, many times you're constrained to what owners you know, allow or are willing to pay for. And unfortunately, like being realistic, you know, money isn't limitless. You have to work within a certain budget and within constraints, and sometimes that means not doing plan A or B or maybe plan C, but you can do you know, what you can to help them. And you have to be able to you know, see animals suffer and, you know, kind of car- and, sorry, and kind of compartmentalize. Um, I see a lot of animals suffering, especially reptiles, when you know, owners aren't properly educated on husbandry and you know, when to bring things in before they become more serious. And a lot of these patients are on death's door and you, you can't judge the owner because they're coming to you for help. But you also need to you know, just be able to compartmentalize and say, I'm going to help fix this pet or I'm going to help ease its suffering and not let it get to you. I mean, you have to you know, feel for them, but you also have to you know, realize this is a tough job. It takes a special kind of person. Yeah. Another thing that, you know, people don't realize about veterinary medicine is the pay isn't as much as you would think. Um, now, don't get me started on on vet tech salaries because that is, you know, sad and, and I wish our techs got paid way, way more. Uh, but people also have unrealistic expectation that vets make as much as, you know, people doctors. And... We really don't. We use the same exact medications. We do the same procedures as human doctors. But since we're dealing with pets, we have to charge for a fraction of the cost because one, you know, insurance isn't as big of a thing, but two, you know, people aren't willing to pay and they wouldn't be able to get care for their pet if we charged the same amount. Um, So, you know, the vet, the average vet salary is increasing. It's um, around 100,000 right now, which is way more than it used to be. Uh, But You know, exotic vets make a lot less than that. You know, people aren't as willing to spend as much money on their birds, reptiles, and pocket pets as they are their dogs and cats, typically. You know, there are exceptions. Um, But uh, there's also not as much maintenance costs, such as regular blood work and vaccines. And um, zoo vets make even less. And that's, you know, there's other factors involved. Uh, typically, zoo vets, they have to go through years and years more of training. They have to do internships and residencies with what their your average GP vet or general practice vet doesn't have to do, and they're way more debt. But because uh, zoos are so competitive, there's just you know, so few zoos and so many people wanting to do zoo medicine, it's so competitive that they're able to pay such minimal amounts and people are still lining up to work there because they, they want to do what they love, which is great, but they deserve you know, a competitive pay as well. And I know that's working at you know, top zoos in the country, barely making fifty or $60,000 a year, which is you know, not very good for someone who has you know, four years of undergraduate degree, four years of vet school, and five, six, seven years of residency and internships and extra training. So... Make sure, if you want to be a vet, you have to really have a, your heart into it and not go into it for the money. Mm-hmm. It is not a field for money, that's for sure. Like if, you know, it, it, you pull up to the veterinary practice, it is not full of Beamers and like fancy cars. We are all driving Nissans. And like, you know, it's, it's it, it, yeah, it, it, you're, you're absolutely right. It is not a very well-paid profession. I know I went on a little bit of a rant there, but it's 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 sad. I wish our our support staff got paid way more, and you know, it, it maybe we're getting there. Yeah. Our customer service reps, I know, like, and our techs, our techs are really struggling compared to our human nurse counterparts. But you know, we do it because we love it, mm-hmm. and that's what's leading to such a shortage because people get burnt out, and it's just not worth the money. And um, you, you deal with no. the a lot of you know, emotional clientele as well. When, when pets are sick, people's emotions run high and, and sometimes it can be a little abusive. I have had owners, you know, let their emotions get the better of them yeah. and you, 
it's it's not an easy mm-hmm. easy time working with them when when they're attacking no, you. So no. it's it, being, being a vet no. is great, but there is definitely aspects of it that you need to be um, ready for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I've been physically threatened. Um, I used to work triage and, um, you know, it is, it, 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 people are, you know, and I, I don't ever blame people. They're in a very stressful situation. They're really, really focusing on their pets. Um, it's not okay that they do it, but I can understand where they're coming from. Um, but yeah, no, I've been there and it's really scary and really sad. And it really takes a lot out of you to be yelled at and yeah, like, for you want to like... recommend the you know best care you can but if you're working within you know someone's budget and they're not willing to spend you know x y and z you know you you feel kind of stuck because you wish you could do everything for free every vet wishes that they could you know do everything mm-hmm. for free for the pets but realistically you can't mm-hmm. keep a clinic open if you're yeah. not charging mm-hmm. for your services because you'll go under and we're already losing techs and support staff and vets left and right because it's not paying off for them. Yeah, and that, and like, I know my coworkers have done it, I've done it, we've all pitched in our own personal money for that one patient mm-hmm. that we're like, you know, we wanna try to help the owners as best we can. We've all been there, and you know, it's just we physically can't do it for every patient. Yeah. Like, we're not rich. <laughs> no, we are not. So, <sighs> I know it's could, tough, it's tough. We could talk for hours, <laughs> I'm sure. We really could. So is there a challenge that you're facing in veterinary medicine and how are you tackling that? So there is a shortage of veterinarians and veterinary technicians and support staff and you know, we're trying to get better by you know, paying them livable wages and um, not taking abuse from clients. And, uh, but we also need to prioritize work-life balance. You know, we can't have vets and vet techs working, you know, 60, 80, 90 hours a week unless they want to. But you know, you, in which a lot of a lot of them do because they feel that they need to, you know, see every sick appointment and you know, get all the pets in because they're like you said earlier, there there's way more pets than vets in the in the um, country right now, and there's we're kind of overrun. You know, it's, sometimes it's hard to fit in every patient that needs to be seen. But you also need to focus on your health, your mental health, and your physical health, and being able to, you know, step back and relax at the end of the day, set time away for your family, and, and not, you know, overrun yourself with work. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do right now. I, I am going into, you know, working four days a week instead of five days a week because I, I had a son and I, I want to be there for him and start my family and. Um, but you also you feel a little bit guilty because you're like, you, you know there's pets to be seen and, and you, you want to be there for them as well. So we just have to figure out how to balance yeah. things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, like for me, I left clinical medicine for my well-being. Um, I, like I miss it so much, but I love my job now. I have a really, really great work-life balance. Mm-hmm. I'm happy coming to work yeah. now. So I was able to use my skills as a vet tech Mm -hmm. in a different capacity here at Zen. And, you know, it definitely helped me a lot um, to get out of that really big, you know, funk that a lot of vet techs fall into. And I'm hoping in the future prioritize (laughs) mental health because it it really is an epidemic, you know, facing the vet community. You know, there's a... um, a movement out there called not one more vet for those that aren't aware where it's you know trying to fight suicide in the veterinary community you know, there are vets and vet techs and you know support staff that are taking their lives because the stress of this job is just becoming too much and you know, it's it's hard so you know we need to start prioritizing mental health in in, the, in our community there yeah, be kind to your vet because there's so much more going on behind the scenes than you realize so you know, just take time to say thank you um, and let them know that they're appreciated. Yeah, that's all we want. We just want to thank you. Just a, just a kind word. <laughs> if you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? It's a good one. I would say not to rush to things. I, I feel like I um, was so set on becoming a vet as quickly as I could that I didn't take time to um, soak in all the experience that I that I had. You know, I, I I did three years of undergrad. I smushed four years into three years, and um, I only did some, you know shadowing and vet tech and stuff on on the side and during the summers. But you know, I, I really um, 
over like I was overrun with with everything and I, I didn't take time to relax and really soak up the experience and for that reason I, I feel like I didn't get as much out of you know out of that school as I could have you know if I if I came in with more years of experience beforehand maybe working as a tech or shadowing then it would have been easier on me in vet school whenever I was learning about medications which I had never seen before and maybe I would have been would have seen them before or heard of them if I had worked longer and so you know I, I would say you know I, I focus a lot on my um, my grades in in college and I because I had good grades I got into vet school in my first try but sometimes you know the the vets that took two three four years to get into vet school are are much better because they have so much more knowledge with their foundation. So I would say, you know, take time to really get a solid foundation before going to vet school. Absolutely. And I, I do agree with that for techs too. Mm -hmm. If you are planning on becoming a veterinary nurse or veterinary technician, um, if you can work in a practice before going into tech school, I think it's um, very beneficial. Mm -hmm. I, I did it and it actually helped me a lot while I was in school because I was able to you know, relate the book work to what I was physically seeing in the ER. So it was really, really beneficial for me. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great piece of advice. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, we have one more question. What's one question you wish I'd ask and how would you have answered? That's, that's a good one. I, I think that you did a really good job asking me a variety of questions. Um, <laughs> Gosh, I have a question that I It's okay if you don't have anything. I mean, sometimes people ask me, like, what, what animal is my favorite or what animal is my least favorite? What animal am I scared of? And, you know, a lot of people think, what, you know, why am I, am I afraid of any reptile or what's the, the animal that I'm most afraid of? And I actually surprise them when I say, um, I'm most afraid of horses. <laughs> and I don't work with horses because you really have to be a horse vet to work with horses. Um, and you know, I you have to grow up with them and read their body language and be comfortable with them. And that was not me. I am from the city. I you know rarely ever went near a horse before going into vet school. And they're just huge beasts. Like they could kill you with one kick. You know, you got to be careful around them. Um, so I'm much more scared of a horse or working with a horse than working with the with the snake. Because snakes, to me, you know, they're they're cute. They're tiny. If they bite, you know, non-venomous snake, yeah. if they bite you, it's typically not a big deal. Um, yeah. But, yeah, horses, man. Gosh. <laughs> a horse. You get kicked by a horse. You're, you're, you're in trouble. You're yeah. definitely in trouble. I, I will stick to my exotics, and, and horse vets will stick to their horses. <laughs> exactly. And it's funny, because, like, the large animal vets are, they love their large mm -hmm. animals, and the small animal vets, they love their and small animals, are, and they don't, they don't cross. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, I agree with you. Horses are scary. Uh, I, I think I like cows a little bit better, except I had some, I don't know, when we did our leg rotation, cat, the cows were kind of scary too. Like they would kick off to the side and stuff. And I, yeah. oh God, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to get trampled by a 2,000 pound steer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love my athletics and I'll, I'll stick with them. <laughs> Yeah, no, same. I love small, scaly guys. Give me all of them. Feathers, furred, scales. I like all the little yes. ones. The little ones are my favorite. Yes. <laughs> well, I think we went over a lot of really great information, Dr. Rachel. I, I really appreciate the time that you took to chat with me. And I hope that we've been able to teach our listeners and our viewers um, some really great stuff about veterinary medicine in the exotics community. Yes, thank you so much for having me and for asking me these questions. And if anyone ever has any questions for me, feel free to reach out. I'm all about educating vets, you know, vet students, vet techs, and even, you know, pet owners that are interested in, you know, taking the best care of their exotic pets. Um, so I'm, I'm always happy to answer questions if they need me. Make sure you check out Dr. Rachel on all of her social media platforms. She is on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and it is exotic.pet.vet. I think we went over a lot of really great information with Dr. Rachel, and I'm so happy that I was able to provide this episode for you guys. Make sure that you are following us and catch us next month for another episode of Casey Talks Critters. And again, we are on your favorite podcast platforms as well. Thanks so much for watching.